the competitive 40K Network presents Art of War. Art of War. Strategy and tactics. Discussion with the best players on the planet. Your hosts, Nick Nanavati and John Damaris. Nick Nanavati and John Damaris. Hello and welcome to the Art of War 40K podcast. I am your host, Tim Penny, and I'm joined by the one, the only, Nick Nadavati, the brown magic. Nick? How are you, Tim? Thank you. I'm good. How are you? And I'm also joined by uh, Sean Rodriguez. Sean recently won uh, a GT, the very well-named LaToya Can't Destroy a GT out of Bad Wolf, New Orleans, or uh, Bad Wolf uh, Store in New Orleans. And he won with uh, Necrons, the uh, the Silver Menace himself. Um, as always, if you've uh, been listening for a long time or this is your first time listening, we're going to be a two-part podcast. The first part, we're going to go over the macro discussion. We're going to talk, talk with uh, Sean. He's going to tell us about how his list came about and his general strategy and thoughts in the building the list and, uh, and how he his general strategy for taking that to the tabletop. Part two for subscribers uh, will be the more uh, micro discussion where we talk about the matchups and we talk about some of the uh, tactics used on a game-by-game basis. Uh, so kicking it off, uh, Sean, why don't you go ahead and tell us a little bit about yourself and tell us about your list. Just run it through so that way we can uh, jump off. Uh, yeah, so obviously you know my name. So um, I'm from South Mississippi and I play Necrons. I play a, uh, it's the most popular Necron uh, dynasty, which is the six inch pregame move and uh, everything's OPSEC and OPSEC models count as double. I run an Overlord. Uh, he has the... Um, Enduring, not enduring will, but the um, eternal madness, uh, rerolling wounds, um, and he is equipped with the void scythe, which is no feel, no pains on the attack, strength uh, plus two, uh, minus four, flat three damage. It's gross. Um, I'm also running for my other characters. The only menace we have, really, the Nightbringer. Um, he's got the antimatter meteor and his signature power, and then uh, I'm also running a Chronomancer for a five up invul and rerolling charges for whatever I want. And then I have a Scorpec Destroyer who has the Veil of Darkness, and he is uh, minus one damage for his Warlord trait. Uh, I'm also running with two squads of Crypto Thralls, one squad of 20 Warriors with the Reapers, two squads of five-man Immortals, one squad of six uh, Scorpec Destroyers, two squads of three Ophidian Destroyers, and two Doomsday Arcs. And that's my whole list. All right. So we definitely see some commonalities here between your Necron list and a lot of other ones that are doing really well, namely like your your dynastic choices for the pregame move and everything counts as obsec. But a lot of your unit choices here are things I haven't really been seeing too much. I don't think I've seen Doomsday Arcs in many competitive lists or Fidian Destroyers. Um, overall, though, I want to talk about just how your army plays on the table. What's the overall strategy here? My overall strategy is um, hopefully, uh, if all goes to plan, I get turn one. I veil in my 20, wa- uh, 20 blob of warriors real close and they can deal a lot of damage i have a couple of strats for their reapers that can make them really nasty at shooting and my scorpec lord really honestly my scorpec lord kind of carries most of my games he's he's kind of a menace in combat with access to minus one to wound and minus one damage on his warlord trait he can be pretty uh pretty gross i kind of keep my uh scorpec destroyers in the back line for kind of for counter charge and i found that doomsday arcs kind of help with anti-infantry fire as well as giving those big shots to any vehicles i can i happen to meet on the table that's the main reason why i took them which is why i'm super excited they got a 20 point reduction <laughs> and then i take my crypto thralls for basic uh basically they're just action monkeys if i need to raise banners or if i have to take uh, deploy scramblers or something like that um, you can put them in strategic reserves for one cp you can put both squads in and uh, my Ophidian Destroyers are basically there as a deep strike threat. If I don't think I need them both in deep strike, I can put one on the table and one in deep strike. And if things go south and I lose first turn, I can always spin one CP during my movement phase and put one, the squad on the table back into reserves to come out next turn. So the list has a lot of mobility and it's uh, a lot of threats in a lot of different places all at once. All right. So it's got a lot of different moving parts, and I definitely like that. When I see the OPSEC Necron armies, they typically try to just completely overwhelm the table and outscore the opponent. They might get tabled by the end of it themselves, but it's okay because they scored so many primary points and robbed their opponents so many also. You're not, it, to me, it doesn't seem like you're going for that because you're not taking like mass scarabs or rays or things that just blitz onto your opponent's objectives. Are you trying to do something else with this army? 
Well, the main reason why I don't take that is because I, I have I know scarabs are point for point. They're probably the best uh, best one of the best units in our codex right now. But I find that once opponents know that I am running, you know, 27 scarabs or something like that and I'm OPSEC, they're going to try and blow all of my small things off the table first. Uh, that way it's going to be harder for me to score secondaries or primaries. Um and uh, that's why I kind of shy away from them. I want, uh, I, I was kind of going for it because the meta down here is they have a lot of like hard hitting fast armies. So I wanted things that would help me like minus one to hit, minus one to wound. I wanted things that would help my units survive a little bit more, which is uh, ultimately why I shied more towards the Chronomancer for the five up invuln rather than the Technomancer for keeping warriors alive. Got it, got it. So that, that makes sense why you didn't go for Scarabs, because it kind of limits your ability to play the mission, actually. All they do is just go forward and stand there, and they all get killed, and then what do you have? I, I totally get right. that. I think when I've run Mass Scarabs, i found something very similar. Still, I'm surprised you didn't run like a couple squads of three or something like that, just for the utility. Um, I actually did at one point. Uh, I had two squads of four in my list at one point, and then I found that they just weren't they weren't scoring points the way that I wanted them to score. So I swapped them out for Crypto Thralls because they're easy to stick into strategic reserves. They can do actions because they're infantry and not swarm. And they're T5 with two wounds apiece. So they're, they're kind of beefy. And then also on top of that, if I need to start them on the table, if I know like my opponent has some kind of sniper or something that can bypass lookout, sir, I can put, start them right next to my Chronomancer so it doesn't get taken off the table on turn one. So yeah, a lot of utility in those little crypto walls. I think that's a great choice. I really do. Um, since you're not running that kind of swarm the opponent style, though, with scarabs and all that, you talk a lot about scoring points and how that's like why you take crypto draws, why you take this or whatever. What points are you trying to score? Like, how does the army, if, are you just still trying to overwhelm the board just with not scarabs or is it something else? Well, I still I still have the ability to overwhelm the board. It's just more of uh, like a quadrant at a time because one of my primaries that I take almost every single game is Perch the Vermin. I think it's I think point for I I think out of secondaries in our codex, it's probably the best secondary we have. I know a lot of people like the one where the noble kills something and you get three victory points for it, but um, I haven't had much luck with that. Maybe I don't know my t- I don't do my timing well, but <laughs> I think Purge the Vermin is because at, by the end of the game, you and your opponent both have very very few units on the table, so you're almost guaranteed turn four and five to get six points each each turn for Purge. I almost always take Deploy Scramblers unless I think I can get uh, a lot of points out of Raise the Banners. Um, and Deploy Scramblers is really good for Crypto Thaws because you can just put them both in strategic reserves for one CP. And then on turn two, one comes out in the midfield and does deploy. And then turn three, by that turn, I have the back line cleared out. I can come in and deploy scramblers in my opponent's uh, deployment zone. Yeah, deploy scramblers. And Purge of Vermin, I think, is a really great one. For those of you who don't know what it is, it's basically uh, starting at the end of your turn two, you get two points for every quarter that your opponent is not in. So if you're swarming the table or, or forcing your opponent to kind of just sit on his side, uh, you're going to score four points pretty indefinitely, like you said at the end there. That's pretty nice. So something something I did want to ask uh, Sean yeah. about uh, Purge the Vermin. And uh I just want to see if this was planned or if it wasn't. If it wasn't planned, this is totally your cue to take credit and say it was. <laughs> um, but your army has is has so much more melee threats than I've normally seen for a Necron army, um, which a lot of Necron armies just kind of like seem like they would just want to exist at you uh, and then maybe like plink out some mortals and some small arms fire. But you have a lot of really fast, heavy hitting uh, melee threats that cross the board and cross it quickly uh, without having to spend a turn out in the open. And I feel like if you take uh, a lot of armies want to kind of hang back uh, and, you know, kind of measure out your threat ranges, ask your threat ranges and and hang back and possibly see board control for a turn or two. Uh, so they won't just get picked up by um, your destroyers, your Ophidian destroyers or uh, your veil, uh, your veil warriors, something like that. And I feel like if they do that, that that could potentially hand you a turn or two of purge the vermin early. Uh, did you find that happened a lot, or was that uh, part yes, of the Yes, actually, um, and not because you just told me to take credit, but um, because I wasn't having a lot of success with the other Necron secondary, the Noble Killing one, um, I, I started taking Purge the Vermin, and a lot of tournaments, people do exactly that, because I do have a lot of fast things in my army, I do have a lot of heavy hitters, and things that are hard to kill. Uh, usually my Chronomancer is giving the 5-up invo to my Scorpec Destroyer, so they have access to my, uh, minus 1 to wound, and... You know, they have a five-up infall, which makes them super nasty in combat. Um, 
and a lot of people just are scared of them and they will not come anywhere near them and rightly so they're they're terrifying but uh they'll stay back and they'll stay over on that side of the board and i'm like okay well i'm just gonna score four points a turn um i'm gonna i'm gonna max this out this game <laughs> excellent yeah i saw uh I've, I've noticed this phenomenon happen with uh with uh, Heard the Prey or Heard the Week, yeah. whatever it's called, uh, with Dark with Dark Eldar. And so when I saw your list, uh, you know, because when we talked beforehand, I was kind of reading up on your list. Like like Nick said, there's a lot of units I hadn't seen. Uh, so I did a little bit of homework, kind of studied mm-hmm. up on them. And I was kind of like, oh, I wonder if if that's the play was here. So that's, uh, that's, that's pretty cool. And that's definitely an interesting way to show how uh, you can build an army around secondaries in a way that's not immediately obvious, like scramblers or engagement right. fronts. So I see that your army has like good ability to play, you know, scramblers engaging all front or scramblers and purges of Remnant are things you're always going to be able to take pretty much, mm-hmm. or if not that banners or something. Is there a third secondary you you typically take, or is that that's uh most of the time it's game by game. Um, usually if I can if I see that a good option uh a good opportunity for grind them down, I'll take grind. Um, sometimes assassinate if they have more than three characters usually assassinates a, a, a one i go to i float to more um and then mm-hmm. obviously mm-hmm. against against psychers and all that other stuff um, i mean it's more game by game i think it's interesting you said you gravitate towards assassinate i don't think that's a very commonly taken secondary even if my opponent has like four or five characters and i could max it out i have to get there and kill all four or five that's like basically tabling them do you find that's something you actually get to do? Um, nine times out of ten, yes. Um, I don't take assassinate often. I will take it if it if they do if they have four characters um, and it's not going to be easy for me to get grind. I will definitely take assassinate if if the opportunity presents itself. I do have the Nightbringer on my list. He is super scary, and uh, you know during one of my turns, I actually I actually time zero two two of my opponent's characters off the table. Um, so that was oh, wow. easy six <laughs> easy six victory points. Um, and if he gets in your face, uh, there's really nothing you can really do about it. He's going to kill something. Yeah. It's interesting you found the Nightbringer so successful. I know I've used him a couple times. Seeks has used him a couple times. And what I find is that uh, he's a great deterrent. He's super scary, but he's not reliable because there's no rerolls anywhere. He's very vulnerable to things such as like transhuman or things like that. Or his mm-hmm. mortals sometimes just don't work. And Yeah. You know, Things don't work in 40k all the time, but also not everything costs 370 points. It's kind of crappy when that doesn't work. So how do you find using him? What's the plan there? Um, so how I use him is actually match by match. Um, and typically if I go against the same opponent more than once, I know their play style and I know whether they're going to try and focus him down or if they're going to just try to run from him all game. And if he, they if they try to run from him, I can basically quarter... I can corner uh, my opponents into a table quarter that I want them to be in. So it's going to be easy for me to uh, either get purge or I can just kind of take out uh, units one by one because they're going to be running from him. So um, and then usually if they don't, if they think they can take him out, uh, I usually try to screen him with something. Uh, that way it's harder for them to smite him. So it's, it's a lot harder for uh, people to kill him in turn one. Um, one of my, well, I'll save that for later. Cause yeah. <laughs> Yeah, we can keep the matchup discussion for yeah. uh, part two. That's where all the good stuff is. So for the Nightbringer, um, I, I like how you're using them to basically either scare your opponent or just make them overcommit to doing damage to them by screening and things like that. Do you find that um, you know not every opponent can do damage in multiple phases? So in some games, right. he's just going to be a rock star. But in the games where you're playing against like Admech or something. They can do mortal wounds in the movement phase with their bombers, then shoot you. Later on, they'll charge you. In those games where your opponent operates in lots of phases, is that a game where the Nightbringer take plays differently, or what's that like? Uh, it it is. Um, you can you you always have the option to keep him back and do like uh, do just Satan power spam, mortal wound spam. Um, you can give him the three three satan powers to do a turn. Uh, you can always you always have access to change out uh, his signature power for another power that you want to use. Um, there's there's nothing in the the codex that says you can't change out his signature power. So usually, if I keep him around as like a mortal wound bomb, I'll take antimatter meteor transdimensional thunderbolt, and then I'll do a random. And then when he gets in, when he's able to get in close, you can always change it back. Uh, I have very little success with his gaze of depth. It usually Me goes off. Like, it really is. I don't know why. I, I usually never done it. anything. <laughs> I usually get it like once, one four up every single game, and I'm like, oh, this is terrible. Why do I take him? <laughs> Honestly, it's like three D three more wounds. Like, actually, hold on here. <laughs> Wait a second. <laughs> 
So something I've found very interesting is um, I've lately it seems like most Necron lists have kind of pivoted into board control. And at first, looking at your list and hearing you talk about it, I'm kind of like, okay, well, this seems more like a very aggressive melee kind of rush build. But the more I hear you talk about it, especially talking about the way about learning your opponents, learning your meta, uh, playing several opponents over and over again, uh, and learning how they play and how they react, um, it seems like a lot of, a lot of it is uh, your army is actually a board control army in disguise uh, because of the mobility and threat. Uh, would you say that's accurate? Because it's what I'm hearing, especially with your secondary choices and the way you use uh, some of your pieces, um, especially the Nightbringer. Yeah, um, I guess uh, I guess you can say that. Um, I usually play 40k like uh, like a game of chess. I like to see how my opponent reacts before I commit to anything. If I if I see a good opening on turn one, I'll I'll usually take it. But like I said, most of my heavy hitters are sitting in the back waiting, uh, waiting for either counter charge or a good opportunity to jump out and and get something. But uh, I, I usually play 40k like a like, like a game of chess. I like to see how my opponent reacts before I actually do anything. And you know, certain time, certain situations requires you to requires me to give up my squad of 20 warriors uh, to win the game. And I mean, I'll absolutely do that if that will will make get me a win. I think that's that's beautiful. I actually like a 40k very similarly in like that chess mentality. I like to be reactive, yeah. see how my opponent, to see what tempo my opponent wants to play at, and then figure it out from there. Right. And you, by taking lots of fast but relatively useful units like you have, you you can really react well. You can either blitz and aggress your opponent because speed can do that, or you can move left or move right or just do whatever you need to do to react well. Is that kind of the philosophy to your list is just do whatever you need to to get the win? Right, exactly. I think I have I have the tools to take a take on just about any list that I, I come across. Um it's a matter of taking them on in the right way and uh kind of gauging my opponent, engaging the threats that he has on the board and how well he utilizes his threats versus how well I utilize mine. I always love getting these types of armies on the podcast because it makes such for interesting matchup discussions and scenarios <laughs> are so uh the script. Yeah, I can't wait till part two. Unfortunately, you're making our job a little bit harder for the strategy section since it changes <laughs> game to game. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> That's okay. So let's no, talk about okay. the warriors, though, because I think okay. this is a very dynamic unit that is going to be used uh, differently in a lot of situations, and it pretty much makes or breaks a lot of your game. You, you said earlier, like turn one, you'll veil it forward to put some pressure on your opponent. What circumstances lead you to doing something like that? What kind of, how do you know when to do that or when not to do it? Wait, when do you use the veil? So uh, I'd say about seven out of 10 games, uh, I'll use the veil more aggressively. Um, typically, I like to use it if I see uh, a priority target or if I see um, my, pos- my opponent misdeploy something or misposition something that I can easily eliminate. Um, and usually I'll veil in just completely obliterate that one thing and then charge into something else if I can to kind of keep them safe during shooting. That's usually how I use it more uh, about three out of 10 games. I'll use it more defensively. I'll just uh, slow march my neck, my warriors up the table. And if my opponent tries to engage them, I score back Lord bails them out and then we counter charge. And that's usually how it goes. So I'm trying to imagine your army playing around the table. There's these warriors that typically go aggressive, but otherwise they'll move around the table the hard way. Mm-hmm. Crypto thralls out flanking or just doing whatever they do to score points. Your fitting destroyers are deep striking. Mortals, I guess, are just hiding. And there's some dudes there. It's like back, it backline seems objective like, holders for the immortals. Yep. Backline objective holders, yeah. Um so it seems like there's not really much to your army. There's there's a couple doomsday arcs, there's a big brick of warriors, there's a nightbringer floating around, and then there's a bunch of just stuff all around the table. How do you like position your units around the table? So I guess what I'm getting at. Um, so I like to position my I like to position my units where uh, my opponent cannot commit to one side of the table. Um, I, I like to position to where I have multiple threats on multiple table quarters or multiple ends. Uh, that way, my opponent has to spread out forces. It makes me it makes it easier for me to pick off things and to uh, kind of uh, go after targets that I really want to go after. Um, sometimes I'll I'll bait opponents into uh, you know coming after one doomsday arc while my other one just you know sits in a corner and bombards everything. Um, and my Ophidian destroyers can come in and just wipe out, you know, pretty much whatever they want in the deployment zone. Um, but uh, I like to position where my opponent just basically can't commit to one thing. He has a lot of different threats in a lot of different areas, and it makes it hard for them to take out one thing if they can't 
uh, commit multiple units to it. Gotcha. So I have, a, uh, mm -hmm. I have a question, or I guess a thought exercise, because I, I almost just can't wait till the matchup section, but I also <laughs> don't want to bury the lead and, and you know give away the farm. Um, it sounds like you your list thrives so much uh, on knowing your opponent and knowing your matchups, and you kind of choose uh, how to start um, kind of almost like that trading war. Um, I'm going to put okay. you in an uncomfortable position. And you can make it a shooting army, a board control army, a melee army. It doesn't matter. Uh, but let's say you go to a big GT, you go to a big major, you're in, you travel to a different meta, and you pair up into an army, you can do whatever you want. You have no idea how it works. No idea. And you're just going to have to wing it and play the best 40k you can. How though, You do want to react, but you have to usually throw out something to commit, start putting points on the board, start getting out there onto the board. Um, in that situation where you have to go in a little bit blind, what is that first unit that you take that first step with? What is that? What is that first way you start to try to establish and build that board control um, and get that's, points? That's uh, yeah, that's difficult. Um, so if I play against something that I've never played before, and then uh, that uh, I don't know my opponent and I don't know the matchup, and everything's just looking really, really bad for me, um, I would say I'd, I'd, I would probably I would probably have to play a really aggressive with my warriors and bail them real close and try to try to delete something. Um, I think that would be my play just to get the game kick started because uh, a lot of my right they, they could probably, probably take, take the counter, counter because uh, my thought process is I probably you know uh, uh, give my warriors the five up invuln and rerolling charges and then bail them in. Um, and uh, just hope that they sur they survive because if I don't know if I don't know the matchup, then that's all I can really uh, really hope for. And if I have to be the first one to take the you know take the step, then that's probably how I would do it. Interesting. So a lot of people when they're faced with uh, a similar scenario, Tim, that was a beautiful question. It's not one we typically ask you, so that's great. But a lot of people, in my first instinct, when like you know you don't know what you're going up against for whatever reason, mm -hmm. and you you have to make a move. I like to tiptoe and baby step into it. This is where I would throw three scarabs out and be like, how are you going to react to that? Obviously the scarabs are going to die, but like, <laughs> right. how do they choose to kill three scarabs? Like, how do they choose to kill uh, five immortals? If I want to get a lot of action on going, maybe I'll throw out three of fitting destroyers or a doomsday art because you got them to commit something real. Um, and you're just like, I'm going to go all in. Here's 20 warriors on your front doorstep. Deal with it. Do you find that to be a risky strategy? Because I know when I've played warriors against warriors, with warriors, whatever, sometimes the fives are hot and sometimes they're not. Yeah, some sometimes they are hot and a lot of times they're not. But, <laughs> but uh, I mean, it is a risk, but at the same time, uh, it is a big threat that my opponent has to deal with. And uh, if they don't, then the warriors can absolutely just run through their lines. Um and I think that's my that was that's my thought process is if uh, I baby step and I tiptoe, then my opponent's going to basically get the upper hand because then they're going to be able to be like, well, you know, he, he he's not going to commit. I'm just going to move on this side of the board and control all of this over here. And then I have they're going to think I have nothing. But at the same time, if I throw a bunch of warriors at them and be like, if you don't deal with these then they're going to destroy all of your all of your infantry, then uh, I think that makes them commit more than what they need to and then that gives me the opportunity to go for a counter punch yeah i actually i actually really like that as an answer because that actually gives you that gives you a ton of information um in that first turn one uh it kind of lets you know if your opponent has the raw power uh to pretty much realistically potentially one shot right. the warrior brick with a single unit if they start bringing out a bunch of units you can kind of tell because everyone at some point has kind of looked at their list and be like well can this handle 20 warriors but it's it's a question that's being asked less and less, at least in my experience, uh, especially as you know, other armies right. have gotten their ninth edition books and everything. And so, but people still remember it exists. And so when they come out, like everyone's, I think most people that know their list are going to kind of be like, oh, well, I don't have that one unit that can handle it. And you can kind of tell a lot about what your opponent's army by what, what units they expose to deal with it. Not only that, but as uh, they start pecking away at your warriors, you can start spreading them out and kind of daisy chain all around the board and really start establishing that, that board control, uh, which is great because you are reacting to your opponent in their, in their shooting phase. And you're also starting to shape the battle space for your follow on forces and your MSU. Um, 
that, that sounds sound that sounds right. right. Um, and overall, you know, 40k is a dice game, but a lot of people don't realize that 40k is an information game. It's turn by turn, you're gathering information from your opponent, and you guys are exchanging information about what you can do on the board, what your units can do, how you play as a player, how you play as a you know a general under your army. And uh, I think that's the biggest thing is gathering information on your opponent. You know, Sean, I have been doing this for. I don't know, a year and a half of interviewing people at the professional <laughs> 40K for three years. I, I've heard a lot of explanations for what 40K is and stuff. I don't think I've ever heard anyone describe it as an information game because it's not like poker or Magic the Gathering or all these no. other games. It's open book. You know, right. you have a question, well, here's the answer. And right. everything should be above board, except, of course, you know, whatever's in your head, which hopefully is not rules you're both holding from your opponent. Right. So with that in mind, what kind of information... And this is honestly, I'm learning too here. What kind of information do you try to glean from your <laughs> opponent? And what kind of, what do you look for when you're trying to glean that information? Mainly like say, let's take the warrior example. Um, if I, if I veil in my warriors real close, it mainly gives me the information from my opponent of how they're going to deal with it. Um, do they want to commit everything to it? Do they want to try to, you know, whittle them down turn by turn? Um, it basically gives me the information of how they're going to deal with it. And then that tells me how they are as a player. I'm a really aggressive player. Like, I, I like to play. I like to play fast-moving armies, which is weird because Necrons are have typically never been a fast, really aggressive army. But I like to play that kind of game sometimes. And uh, I, if I can get that information out and I can see how my opponent's going to react to the threat that I give them, then uh, it'll basically tell me how I need to win the game. That's super interesting. Like the way people can react to things. Like I, mm-hmm. if anyone's ever watched me play a game, like I'm super defensive, reactive. I'll sit in the corner all day if you let me do it. So <laughs> um, it's always so interesting to hear like an aggressive player's take on it, just because it's so opposite of mine. You're like when you say you'll veil twenty warriors to one on their front doorstep, I'm like that's such an auto loss condition. What are you doing? What if they just kill twenty wars? You're like that's fine. Right. I mean, uh, obviously it works because I mean, if you look at my if if you look at my games on uh, mm-hmm. on BCP, I mean, I have several first place wins, and I've used that exact strategy to get those first place wins. Yeah, it's it's super cool. I, I mean, really, I mean that's what we're here, right? <laughs> to figure yeah. out how it all works. Yeah, it's hard. Yeah, hard, hard, hard to argue. So with I want to know, you know. I have a couple more questions. First, uh-huh. what is your army doing when your warriors are bailing turn one? So I imagine. You, we go first, go second. You don't know until it's after it happens. So you're deployed pretty defensively, I guess. Is that correct? Right, and that's the glory behind the uh, the dynasty choice. Uh, Necrons being having that dynasty choice, the pregame six inch move, because you don't actually move anything until before the first turn begins. So after you know who's going first or second, then you can do your move. So if you if you deploy everything like right on the line and play really aggressive, and then you lose your roll off, you can be like, oh well, I'm just going to reposition things. And then if you play really defensive and you win first term, you can just move everything out. And which is why I think my doomsday arcs are so devastating is um, I can hide them behind ruins. I can hide them behind obscure and terrain. And uh, if I lose first turn, they just sit there. Uh, if I get first turn, the pregame six inch move pumps them out to where they need to shoot at things. And then they just blow things up. Um, I think that's, uh, I, th- I think the dynasty is what actually makes uh, my list such a good list is because of how how I can operate between knowing or between the deployment and who's going first. Yeah, no, I think that's such a huge boon. That's relentless expansionist. Anything that lets you redeploy is just such a powerful rule. Now, oh, only yeah. six inches isn't. It's it's not. I'm over here on the right flank. Let me go <laughs> right. forty inches to the left. Right? <laughs> but but six inches is the difference of here's a ruin, not where I want to be deployed if I'm going first. But you know a good place to be if I'm going second. Let me deploy, deploy within six of it. So either I go first and go forward or go second and go backwards. Really simple. Right. Yeah. I, I, I love the pregame moves. And the at the risk of sounding extremely silly, uh, if you go first, it makes you go firster. And if you go second, <laughs> it makes you go seconder in the way that, you know, it, like, it, it, it makes your it, offense more offensive. You know, I find myself, even defensive. if I don't take uh, Eternal Conquerors, the, the OPSEC, uh, dynasty choice uh i i find myself taking the pregame six inch move more than more and more because uh it just gives you that flexibility and um if you mess up in your deployment you can be like oh well i can just shift this blob over a little bit so they can't be seen because i've messed up in my deployment you know there we go problem solved so it's it's also really nice uh i think um you let me know if this has ever come up just totally validating here but when you ever have like that person who tries to like set like that, they have that really strong shooting unit and they try to place it where they have just 
a little bit of line of sight to like something of yours that they want dead, but they are also trying not to expose it to the rest of your army. But their field of vision is, uh, their field of vision or line of sight is very narrow. And then you just kind of move that six inches. And next thing you know, it's like, well, they no longer get that safe shot. If they still want to take a shot, they have to now expose that unit. And that, that's oh, like, yeah, be a real it is like if uh, you go up against someone and they bring, you know, some relic contemptors, which is the big nasty right now. Um, if they bring some of those and they're like, I'm just going to, you know, I, I can see the tip of your doomsday arc. And I'm like, well, you know, it's, he's not going to be there for long. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's I beautiful. I think that's so subtle and so like your army is is very not overly offensive. Like when I look at it, it just looks like a pile of stuff. But then mm-hmm. when you put it all together and you like cut the angle so that the relic contemptor can't do anything on turn one, like that's just it's good interaction. It's got a lot of good stuff going for it. I was I was impressed because when you first showed me the list, I was looking at it. I was like, I was like, where's the rest <laughs> of this list? You know, yeah. and I was like. <laughs> And but like listening you talk about it, it's really cool. I'm I'm starting to kind of get a picture. I was of like genuinely a non-believer place. when this podcast started. <laughs> <laughs> when this episode started recording, this guy hasn't been winning. <laughs> <laughs> so I get. I guess uh, yeah. I, I do have a follow-up question. Uh, most lists, especially people that we have on here, um, it's it's very rare that someone just like you know goes out and buys a couple battle boxes and some star collecting boxes throws it all together, goes out and wins a GT. Usually what we're seeing is we're usually seeing the uh, the result of several iterations, trial and error, um, meta research, uh, repetitions and stuff like that. Um, so I guess I have to ask is what was the, how did this list truly start, I guess, in its infancy? And what was the core that remained uh, of that original list? And then what have, what's evolved uh, since then? So the list actually started out as like a very shooty list. Um, I I wasn't taking the uh, the the relentless or not the relentless the uh, eternal conquerors dynasty, but I was taking uh, like three squads of twenty warriors with flares, and I was using the uh, the if you stand still during your move phase, you can rapid fire at max range, and it was it started out as a complete shooty army, and then. Uh, like I think the list just thrives down here. I don't know. I need to take it to a, a like a, a major to see how it would actually function, and I, I'm definitely going to do that when the next major that comes. But um, I wanted to take it to Dallas, but uh, certain you know family circumstances happened. I had to drop, and but um, it started out as a big shooty list, and uh, after like a lot of tweaking and a lot of uh, fiddling around with the list, it basically just dropped down to a t- one twenty man blob and some immortals for shooting, and then you know doomsday arcs for uh, anti tank and heavy support, and then you know all my melee threats that I have. But um, like I've 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 also thought about taking out the Ophidian destroyers just because um, the last two the last few games I've played they've they're the deep strike threat that I need, but they kind of underperform a little bit. Um, um, they, I'm they are fast, that. So but, fast. Uh, they are fragile. They're only T4 with three wounds, and uh, I say only three wounds, but they're T4 with uh, three wounds, and they don't get the minus one to hit until they're in melee. So, don't um, they have four up armor or something? Yeah, is four up hurt? armor. It's not good. Um, the deep strike threat is why I have them in my list, um, and if I do keep them, that would probably be the only reason. I, I'll probably drop one squad, cause, but I I love the score pack destroyers. I think they're. I think they're the best melee option in our our codex right now. Just they can hit so hard, and they have so many attacks. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think if you take them like in a Novak dynasty and give them the plus one attacks, and then take a plasma site alongside of them and give them plus one strength and attacks, you can just wreck anything they go up against. Um, I've seen I've seen a squad of six with that same setup uh, just one shot a night. <laughs> no, wow. So. Um, it sounds like your list started as shooty, as you said, and with the shooting army, you're going to have a lot more damage output, but you're going to lose speed and board control and melee capability, of course, which you've right. since then added at the cost of your shooting damage output, of course, because that's how this stuff works. So mm-hmm. do you find your army isn't offensive enough or do you still get it done? Like, where does that balance? Lie? I think it's more balanced than it is offensive or defensive, if that makes any sense. Um I think uh, I still get I still get a lot of uh, good anti infantry shots from the Doomsday Arcs because they get ten shots and then twenty at rapid fire range and then they get the big cannon and then you know immortals get their their things and then uh, but uh, like at if I you know like I said Velen warriors close that's you know forty shots at 
coming at someone at AP two strength five. Um, I think the shooting's there. It's just very situational and how I play my warriors mostly um, about whether my army can be as shooty as I want it to be. But I think it's a lot more balanced than it is more, you know, aggressive or defensive. And that makes sense. Since like you said, the overall strategy, the strategy to the army is basically just figure out, figure it out in the moment and play that game of 40 K. Right. Not do this exact thing over and over again. So you need to be super flexible like that. Right. Because ultimately, 40K, like like I said, it is a dice game. So it's like if you do the same thing over and over again, you know, event, eventually you're going to you're going to run into a, an, a either an opponent that's going to know how to counter that or your dice are just not going to be your friend. So <laughs> you need to learn how to adapt. Yeah, a lot of players um, I find run these super math hammer lists. Here's my 85 dreadnoughts that just reroll everything and mathematically destroy you. And that'll get you very far, don't get me wrong. Having the mathematically strongest army in the game, whatever it might be at that time, there is something to be said for it. But there's always someone taller, you know, like right. this, the, the best shooting army does at some point, it doesn't shoot this problem away. It can't shoot through a wall. You know, there's always right. something that could be, could go wrong for you there. If, even if you bake rerolls in there forever and you know, how bad can you roll? It doesn't matter if you can't roll kind of thing. There are situations right. you get yourself into. Like, you know, it's, it's like if, uh, yeah, you have this awesome shooty army. Here's, you know, uh, 40, uh, Skitari Rangers with, a shit ton of shots but good luck hitting me because you can't see me <laughs> absolutely yeah so i guess uh we talked about the uh i guess the past and the present list um before before going into the matchups uh part two i'd want to say uh have you looked at the the new gt pack and the new changes to the secondaries are there any changes you're thinking about the list uh, that are driven because i of those have changes to um I, there's a few changes that i thought of and like uh Obviously, like I told you about the Ophidian Destroyers, I'm thinking about taking them out, and those uh, mainly because they were underperforming. But uh, I've I've actually thought about adding in a third squad of Cryptothralls because of uh, how the deployed Scramblers, uh, you know, secondary changed. Uh, being able to get those with just because I think Cryptothralls for 40 points and two 32 it's, mil bases is really hard to screen out. They're so good. Yeah. Yeah. They're only like they're only like they're, they're only they're like what, like one or two PC power levels, so they wouldn't even. So it shouldn't even, yeah. Right. So when we even cost you an extra, they're so good at that. Unit and with the uh, and with the forty points, I save on my doomsday arcs. I can do exactly that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, well, they did go down. Uh, they there, from, that's uh, that's awesome. Right, they went from one hundred ninety to one hundred seventy. So there was one more question I had to ask about your list because it's mm -hmm. just so it's so different from how I play forty k, and I think right. that's awesome because obviously you're successful with it as well. Right. You you talk about deep striking a lot of stuff in a lot of games, like hitting destroyers, veiling the warriors, things like that. Trying to make charges out of reserves, twelve inch rapid fire guns doing the work. Do screens just like suck for you? Is there a plan about screens? Like armies like guard with just tons and tons of trap or dark eldar things like that. They it it does suck because that means I'd have to put my warriors into something that they really don't want to go in. I've I've played a few guard players, um, and usually I find that like. I can veil. I can veil my warriors close, and you know, ha split my shots between two different squads, and or two or three different squads, and then you know, not kill one and charge charge a squad to keep my warriors safe. And that's typically how it how it plays out. But uh, I've <laughs> it it does exactly. I like screening sucks. I hate it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean that's that's a fair answer, I suppose. <laughs> Do you find that like there's a there are ran, there's a randomness to your army that makes it unreliable, or do you think there's so many random elements that eventually you're going to hit the lottery with it? Uh, and by that I mean like you have the doomsday arts, you're going for nine inch charges. None of this stuff is supposed to do that much work, but you know every now and then right. the doomsday arc just falls right. Out I've had games like I said, I've had games where my Ophidian destroyers come out of deep strike and they do absolutely nothing and they die. <laughs> it was, it's great. But, uh, yeah, uh, I can't <laughs> imagine that's uncommon. Like that's but, to me that's what they do half the time. <laughs> right, and uh. Nine times out of ten, it's like my warriors and my Scorpec Lord and my Overlord just carrying my games. And obviously, Doomsday Arcs, like I've uh, one of my games at the GT. I don't know if you guys want me to talk about it or wait, but. Well, we'll get into the yeah. GT games in, in depth okay. in, in part That's two. Fine. Yeah. I do have uh, one more follow up question, I guess. You mm -hmm. just keep sparking questions. If the warriors <laughs> and the Scorpec Lord and all that just keep doing the work, why not go down the warrior variation to the Necron armies and just from like 40, 60, 80 of these things? I've I've thought about it and I'm actually experimenting with a uh with with a sixty uh warrior list with two Scorpec Lords and a bunch of uh 
uh, Scorpac Destroyers. I'm actually experimenting with that list right now. What is it about these Scorpac Lords and Destroyers? I've used them one time. I thought nothing special. You know, they walk well, decently okay across the table and die. They do, but um, I mean, they're 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 fast. They're moving at eight inches. The the Scorpac Destroyers are T five strength five. The Scorpac Lord is T six strength six. Uh, like. And they all have access to minus one to wound, which I think minus one to wound is so big. Um, it just it keeps your guys alive a lot longer than they should be. And if you have a chronomancer behind them, giving them rerolling charges and giving them a five up invul, it just it makes them so beefy. And it it, it honestly makes them it makes them a, like a, a a big threat that people just have to focus down. And if they you know spend all their time focusing down that one thing i'm just running around the board with all these different things just you know overwhelming you mm -hmm. that makes sense to me i think that's that's really what it is too it's just like such an overwhelming force because it comes out at you all at once like the same turn 20 warriors are in your face there's also doomsday arcs flying out from behind the rocks and there's defending destroyers and scorpex like threatening a, a turn two counter charge right there's a lot going on there is yeah, it's, it feels like uh, almost every single threat that you present, if you decide to present multiple threats at once, every single major threat uh, that you have, your your destroyers, uh, your Nightbringer, your 20 mm -hmm. warriors, your Doomsday Arcs, each one of them takes a different right. type of answer. And so it's very, and not only that, but a lot of times, like a lot, I've seen a lot of theory about, you know, people, oh, how does my army one turn a Catan? And they'll be like, okay, well, I can do this, this, and then do this strat and do this, and it requires a lot of positioning, a lot of points of failure, and it is also, uh, I know when I thought about it personally, it's very hard to set that up, and at the same time, deal with 20 warriors in right. the same turn, you know, and have enough resources to go around, you know, and then it just seems like you can very quickly, if you threat Overlord, you can also complicate the board state uh, for your opponent. Right, it, it does that, um, it absolutely does that. Um... It's just, uh, like I said in the beginning, it's a lot of threats in a lot of different places, and each of them require a specific answer. And if you don't answer it with the right thing, then you know you're, you're you just get overrun, and they're all of the threats are at, are hard to deal with. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's a really cool army. I think it's it's not the Necrons. You know, there's only so many options you have in that codex. Unfortunately, hopefully they get some more like supplement love. But it's I cool to see you so. find new archetypes and things that work with them. That's that's awesome right. to see. My second army, like Space Wolves, were, our wolf guards stayed the same, so I'm happy about that. <laughs> <laughs> nice. So Tim, is there any other questions you want to ask before we hop on over to part two? No, I think that pretty much, uh, that pretty much took care of it. Is there anything uh, generic that you want to add, Sean, before we uh, go to part two for our uh, Patreons and uh, um, Actually, if I could just give a like a quick shout out to a few people, then that would be please do. Be awesome. yeah. yeah. So uh, obviously, my team saw Hammer down in uh, South Mississippi. Uh, they are a big part of why I'm so successful. Uh, Jerry Biggs is, uh, you know, he founded the team and he's he brought me on, and he's a reason why I. I love 40k and i play 40k all the time uh him and lewis have actually if you know sweet lou on bcp he's a blood angels player they're the reasons why i'm you know i'm i'm as successful as i am because if they hadn't kicked my teeth in as many times as they did maybe i wouldn't be here awesome well yeah that's definitely one of the best ways to learn is just uh it's just playing the people who are better than you and just, just getting <laughs> absolutely put over and over again <laughs> Awesome. Well, thanks so much for listening, everyone. We will catch you over at part two, which is our tactics section. That's where we're going to deep dive into Sean's matchups from the tournament and then other matchups that maybe he didn't play against, but definitely you'll want to have a plan for. So since his strategy is very matchup dependent, I'm super excited about this. <laughs> All right, everyone, if you want to subscribe to, to part two, you can go over and check the link below. It's in the art of war 40 k.com, our website, and we'll see you later. Like what you just listened to? Check out Art of War Down Under, where we break down armies and new rules. Theartofwar40k.com This episode was brought to you by the Competitive 40K Network.
Want to learn even more? Enter the War Room. Gain access to six classes per week. Coaching games, strategy sessions. Have the best players in the world at your fingertips. TheArtOfWar40K.com 